How is everybody? How are you doing? My word, it's cold today. <laughs> it's, uh, I think it's zero degrees today. Zero degrees. And the level of my commitment to filming, I'm only wearing fingerless gloves so I can operate my camera. So whether I have frostbite by the end or not, I don't know. But today, I'm going to take you on the walk I do more than any other walk. More than any other walk by far. This is the walk that really kept me sort of sane during the kind of tumultuous year of 2020. And luckily for me, it just happens to be through one of the most fantastic and storied locations in London. Yesterday, <laughs> I'm finally doing it. I'm finally doing my, I was going to say comprehensive story of Wanstead Park, but I'm almost certain to omit certain things and there will be some wonderful comments on this video, I'm sure, with great information. There's so much to tell you about today. This has got to be one of the greatest London stories. And I don't say that lightly. This is one of the greatest London stories. We have everything. There's the Lost Palace, of course. But we've got a story here that goes from the Mesolithic through the Roman period with antiquities that have been uncovered through to the Tudors and the Stuarts with, with monarchy, with some of the most famous monarchs in our history, through to the East India Company, and then right through to the present day where it's a, a land that's controlled by the Corporation of London and populated by dog walkers, joggers and vodka swilling teenagers. But to start with, we're going to enter the park via this avenue that was laid out sometime probably in the 18th century. We're not 100% sure when. And we're not 100% sure by whom. I think in the past I've erroneously claimed it was by the famous gardener Humphrey Repton probably wasn't Repton, but it may well have been the gardener called Adam Holt, who lived in Leytonstone, not far from where I live actually, he lived near the, uh, near the Heathcote Arms pub. I love this little open glade here, between the avenue and, and Bushwood, the Bushwood housing estate. It's a really beautiful spot, and particularly Last summer, that tree there became a kind of place of congregation, a place where people would meet up, would sit and have picnics and all sorts. It's a really wonderful little spot. My friend Andrew sent me a really interesting article about a really sort of forgotten part of the history of this area. The story of when this area, and I think it was here, probably here, was when anarchists used to gather on Wanstead Flats. It became a real focus of kind of anarchist meetings in the late 19th century when anarchism was really quite a big thing in, um, in London. There was a lot of anarchist activity. The famous Rudolf Rocker, I should say really, the notorious Rudolf Rocker, he used to bring Jewish textile workers out from the East End for forays into the forest and catch the tram up to the, to the Green Man, have a couple of pints, then go walking in the forest. And other famous sort of anarchist speakers used to gather somewhere near Bushwood. It was somewhere near the Lay Spring Estate. And this open space here, the fact when I saw people gathering here over the last couple of years, I think it would be a good location for that. My Instagram feed is absolutely kind of graffitied with images of this part of the avenue. It's so beautiful and it's beautifully aligned with the sunset. The sunset's right at the end there, which is often actually when I'm walking along here in that last hour of light. It's really delightful. Over on our left here we have Bushwood and then to the right there's this curious great big white tower block which really catches the sunsets and I often get asked about it and it has an interesting history that site. So this tower block used to be um, police accommodation I believe but it stands on the site of what was once a very sort of large lake, one of the water features of Wanstead Park of which there are many and in the middle of the lake, somewhere in that housing estate, there was a, a house called the Lake House. It seems to have just been a, a single room that was possibly used for entertainments. It was quite elaborately furnished, I think. And the poet Tom Hood spent some time there, the famous poet of Leytonstone, and wrote 
an epic poem about Wanstead Park. So if you follow the avenue all the way to the end, it gives you an idea of the alignment with the original Wanstead house. It would have been straight on up there. We would go straight on there, you hit the road. But just across from the road, some of the original gateposts of the 18th century Wanstead house, the grand mansion, one of the biggest palaces in the whole land. So just over here on the corner of Bush Road and Overton Drive, we have one of the few surviving relics of the great Wanstead house. These were the gateposts that would have greeted people on their arrival to the vast, vast pile that was Richard Child's Wanstead house. And there at the top of the stone pillar you can see his initials RC, Richard Child, Sir Richard Child. And looking back down here along Bush Road, which was originally the main drive that led to the great Wanstead house. Carried on down here along Overton Drive. It's wonderful. You learn something all the time when you go out walking. I was just stood here doing a little bit of filming and a fellow walking his dog came past. And we started talking about the avenue. And he said he'd been told a few times and found in a few locations that actually this avenue here was laid along the line of a Roman road, which is really curious because there are a few Roman roads through the area. And the exact course is not really completely pinned down. It's always assumed that it went up Leightonstone High Road and there's the old milestone there. You can see that's believed the base of that stone is believed to be a Roman milestone. And then it went onwards. But actually, this would work out because if you look behind me, the alignment here does lead straight down to the towers of the City of London. So could this, could this be a lost Roman road through Leighton Stone? It very well could. Also, the gentleman also pointed out that many of the trees along this avenue seem older than the 18th century landscaping that this is assumed to be part of. So it doesn't, seem to, doesn't mean to say it wasn't landscaped in the 18th century. They just may have followed the course of the Roman road because, as we will see later on, there are plenty of Roman antiquities in Wanstead Park that would have been along the course of this road. Amazing. Things you learn when you go out for a walk. We just have to get across this very busy road here. And once you're over the road, it's straight into Wanstead Park. We're going to deviate slightly from the walk that I was doing throughout 2020, where I discovered the paths to the right here, and it, you drop down into Reservoir Wood, and the path leads you all the way around the back. We will pick that up, but we've got to go down here to take a look at a very special tree. Sometime last year, I was sent a really... Uh, wonderful map by a great fella called Jeff. Jeffs tend to be very dependable characters, don't they? Jeffs. You can always rely on a Jeff. Well, this Jeff sent me a wonderful annotated map, and it was Roke's 1735 map of Wanstead Park. And he'd annotated it with some notes. It was really it was fantastic. And um, I hadn't really made the connection between the undulations in here. If you walk through here, two things you'll notice. Number one, at a moment, in the winter, particularly. It's one of the muddiest places on earth. It's muddier than the mud flats of Mudlavia. It's incredible. But you'll also notice a number of kind of like ditches and undulations. We're about to cross one here. And um, look, look at this little, what looks like a little stream here. And on uh, the Roke map of 1735, it shows that this was a reservoir I think it was used to help feed the, the water features that stretch throughout Wanstead Park. Quite a lot of them are still there, but it's a kind of a small portion of what was originally part of the landscaping. And this was the reservoir, so there were sort of like channels dug to feed water into this large reservoir here. I suppose the 
good thing about the frost and the snow is that it's, <laughs> it's frozen the mud to make this passable. Otherwise, you find the mud almost going over your boots through here. Another lovely email I received last year was from a lady asking if she could use one of my numerous photographs of the famous Repton Oak on the front cover of her book of poetry. To which I said, of course, please, by all means, do. Have you got it downloaded? She went, yes, I'm sure. What I didn't want to say to her was, which one is the Repton Oak, <laughs> the famous Repton Oak? Well, it's actually, it's this tree here. When I first posted a picture of this back in, I think, 2006, somebody in the comments told me that local kids used to call this the octopus tree. So that's what I always knew it as, the octopus tree. Of course, it's many people's favourite tree in Wanstead Park. But it's more formally known as the Repton Oak. And in Jeff's brilliant notes that he sent, he says that Repton planted this by planting a number of oak trees in the same place and then they would create this kind of very curious, quite beautiful shape. As much as I would never want to disagree with a Jeff, that's a good life tip, don't disagree with a Jeff, all I would do is possibly sound a note of caution about whether Repton did in fact plant this oak tree. That's going to cause so much dissent in the comments. The only reason I say that is there is a lot of debate about the degree to which Humphrey Repton, the great gardener, some people say the last great English gardener, that some degree about, did Repton do any work on Wanstead Park? He certainly drew up plans, he gave notes, he gave advice, but did he actually do any physical work? Some people claim yes, and they can point to various things, like they say, this is the Repton Oak. Other people say, well, no, there's no evidence. But I did meet a gentleman once after I gave a talk, and I made that claim that, Repton did no work on Wanstead Park and he came up to me and he said well actually he did he did do one corner of um, the house of Wanstead Park he did landscape one particular bit can I find the notes I wrote after that talk to say where it was I can't yet if I do I'll put them on the screen but he just uh, this gentleman was no just a uh, punter who just wandered up to have a chat after a talk he was uh, the conservation officer at the uh, Corporation of London who oversaw the restoration of this park. I think it must have been in the 70s or 80s. So he would know what he was talking about. I think, here's what I'm going to say, I think the bit that Repton did, that this gentleman told me that Repton actually did, was over near the kiosk, near the tea hut, near the perch pond, I think. Do you know what, I think I am going to take you back through Reservoir Wood and around that back path because I really love that back path. It's really great, I want to show it to you. So we've doubled back on ourselves and come to this path that runs to the right of the main path into Wanstead Park. And I like this because it feels like a secret. You very rarely get people walking along this path when it's really busy in the summer and everyone's on that main path there going past the alleged Repton Oak, the octopus tree. There's hardly anyone down here, it's really wonderful. Right, you can see there's a lot of water in this channel in the summer, it's just really a muddy ditch, but here you can see it's like a little brook. And so this must be some of the, the cuttings that were made to feed water around the reservoir and, and into the water features, the lakes of Wanstead Park. You can see how this little brook here is leading into the shoulder of Mutton Pond, which is our next significant location. The shoulder of Mutton Pond often freezes over completely. Sometimes it's just a sheet of ice and you see the, the birds skidding across the surface. It really is one of the most picturesque locations in the whole of Wanstead Park particularly at sunset as well. It's really gorgeous down here. I believe the name comes from the fact that it is shaped like a shoulder of mutton. I can't remember where I got that from, but um, yeah, it seems plausible, doesn't it? Because you do see shoulder of mutton ponds in other places. I'm pretty sure I have. And you can see how this side of the lakes 
pretty much frozen. All the birds are on the far side there. We will walk around that side so we can get that view as well. But we'll just take this path here that leads around the edge of the shoulder of Mutton Pond and get the other view. And then we can get one of the best views in the whole of Wanstead Park. There are quite a few great views, but this is one of the finest. sight there's two swans in that little thawed out stretch of water there between the ice a number of Roman antiquities have been discovered in Wanstead Park more of that later but some of them were recovered in these fairways here not far from the perch pond this is Wanstead Golf Club and that is where they are placed on the 1894 Ordnance Survey map. So this is the uh, 1894 Ordnance Survey map of Wanstead Park, or certainly part of it anyway. And you can see there the site of Wanstead House on the golf club there, near the, uh, near the basin. St Mary's Church, we'll get to that towards the end of the walk. Some Roman pottery in St Mary's Churchyard. We'll see that site later, hopefully. But here are the first Roman antiquities there. And you can see, actually, it's a little bit further along this fairway, but I don't think we can see it up there. We've got the shoulder of Mutton Pond down here, the Heronry Pond, which we're coming to next. And over there on those fairways, you have Roman antiquities, consisting of tessellated pavement, pottery, etc., and found in various parts of this park, from 1726 to 1746, I believe by Adam Holt, the gardener. This is roughly the site on the map, but actually I don't think that text indicates the exact location of the finds. And this view up here, along the Heronry Pond, towards the tea hut, the beacon of hope on a walk. And they have a light there on the front which shines across the water in the evening. It's really beautiful. And this is a magical location. The heron, of course, is the great iconic motif of Wanstead. It's animating spirit. According to a wonderful booklet published in 1894, written by Oliver Dawson, called The Story of Wanstead Park. He says that it's on the, the island here in the Heronry Pond that the herons first took up residency before they moved down to Lincoln Island, which is what we'll see quite shortly. And we, should, we should look out for some herons because Dawson says that they arrive in the first two weeks of February, which is now. So hopefully we'll see some herons on the wing. It's gone from bitterly cold to freezing bitterly cold now, which is good in a way because it means there's not so many people around. <laughs> but what we'll do now, I think we should go and have a look at the Roman antiquities near the tea hut, which is just as well. I mean, we'll say look at them, we'll look at the site, or the proposed site of the Roman villa. Isn't it amazing? Which is a long mystery connected to this park, which I think was only recently solved. But before we go, the Roman antiquities, we must stop to admire this avenue of trees here. Came here with my dad a few years ago. My dad was a gardener, pretty much his whole working life, more or less. And I think he told me there were lime trees that were often used for avenues because they grow quite straight. Avenue leads to one of the very few surviving buildings of the great Wanstead House and Park. The temple at the end there. The temple. Sounds very, sounds very grand, doesn't it? I mean, it isn't a temple, but it is called the temple. So for us, it'll be a temple. This wood here, to the left of the, of the avenue leading down to the temple. Chalet wood but really known as bluebell wood. The displays of bluebells here are absolutely stunning. So many people come here just to look at the bluebells.
And you can see the way that the, the avenue here aligns with the Heronry Pond, one of the main water features of the park. The manor of Wanstead goes back a very long time. The name Wanstead is said to mean either Wanstead, W-A-N-stead, White House, or either, and my favourite, Wodenstead. Wodenstead, the place of Woden. If you had a choice between the White House or the place of Woden, I'd go for the place of Woden, wouldn't you? Anyway, where it really kind of enters history is when it's bought by Henry VII in 1499. He paid just £360 for it. Not bad, eh? But then by the middle of the 16th century, I think by 1540-something, 1547 from memory, it was recorded as being in ruins. It's then that it's purchased by a guy called, with a brilliant name, Sir Richard Rich. He must have made that up, right? Sir Richard Rich. And he built the very first Wanstead Hall. Before that, it'd been like a, there'd been a building here. It had been a, a royal hunting lodge. Apparently, Henry VII spent quite a lot of time here. When Mary Tudor was proclaimed queen, and her sister, Elizabeth I, rode out here to Wanstead to meet her, I imagine to kind of curry favour with her before her sister rode into London to oust Lady Jane Grey. Elizabeth I, when Queen, must have developed quite an affection for, for Wanstead and Wanstead Hall, because she spent quite a bit of time here. Two of her favourites owned the house. First, Robert Earl of Dudley, and entertained her here a number of times. And it passed from him to another of her favourites, the Earl of Essex. And again, the Queen spent time here in the company of the Earl of Essex. I'll let you fill in the blanks to what she may have been doing out here in Wanstead. Apparently this wonderful building here called the Temple was just used, well it had various uses, but one of them was just to keep the kind of poultry and game for the big house. It shows you what kind of house it was, doesn't it? Apparently this area here is known as the Plain. I was reading a wonderful report in London Archaeologist of the quest to find the Roman ruins or the Roman villa associated with the fragments of tessellated pavement and mosaic unearthed by Adam Holt in the 18th century. And it was this area here known as the Plains and the area known as Elsdon Tufts that became the real focus of attention, the most likely location of the Roman villa. This area now is most notable A for dog walkers and B for ant hills. They're massive ant hills here. Some initial geophysical surveys were carried out. They found a couple of like circular structures. I think that was sort of more down towards near the, uh, the perch pond. But certainly on this terrain here around the plain around Elsdon Tufts. It was inconclusive. The speculation was that, in fact, actually what they found was a pre-Roman structure, some sort of pre-Roman settlement. Then they came back later on when they had slightly better equipment and they did a more extensive survey of the area. And they found two things. One, they pretty much confirmed that the circular structures were of pre-Roman origin. And secondly, they found the outline of a square building about two metres down that had most likely been covered up by the, uh, the moving of the earth, the earthworks, when they built these water features, these enormous water features. And remember, these are only a fraction of what was here when the park was landscaped by Holt and others in the 18th century and it most likely had been buried deep below. I mean, you couldn't conclusively say it was definitely a Roman villa, but they did find a large square-shaped building or oblong-shaped building clearly showing walls and there was brickwork beneath the ground here. So where I'm stood right now is possibly the site of Wanstead's Roman villa. of my 
my favourite spots in One Step Park, the perch pond. So delightful here. Another remnant of the waterscape of the park, the 18th century landscaping. So in 1673, Wanstead Park and House was bought by Sir Josiah Child, delightfully described by the diarist John Evelyn as a suddenly moneyed man, <laughs> which is a beautiful bit of snobbery, isn't it? And he then passed it on to his son, uh, Richard Child. So Richard Child, and it was Sir Richard Child who became uh, a baron and a viscount. I think he became Viscount Castlemaine, which just makes me think of Castlemaine Forex, Australian lager, and those wonderful adverts in the 80s for it. Those of you of a certain vintage world uh, remember that. Seems appropriate, doesn't it? And it was Sir Richard Child who really went big on the estate. He built the vast, vast palace, really, of Wanstead House and did all this landscaping. He commissioned this landscaping of the grounds. And he spent as much on the landscaping as he did on the house. He spent £360,000 on the house. That was in 1715. And the same amount of money on landscaping the gardens here. As we'll see later, it didn't all really work out once this vast wealth was passed down through various hands. Richard passed from being a baron and a viscount to an earl, but he ended up taking his wife's name and became Earl Tilney. And it's the second Earl Tilney who added one of the most curious features in the park, which we'll see up here, and it's one of my favourite spots. It's got, well, you can make up what straws you want for it. Wait till you see it. We've got to go around the lake first, though, so hold your horses. There's still some more wonders to come. I know, it seems impossible, right? Think, how can there be even more? Well, there is. continue down past the perch pond down towards the ornamental waters with its grotto and its canal perfect for sunset and I think this is one of the channels that was cut to feed water from the river roading into the ornamental waters I'm not 100% sure about that. We'll take this snowy path here, which is going to lead us around the canal. So at this point, the path splits. You can carry straight on there. And that gives you slightly better views of the river roading if you go that way. If you go this way, it's a little bit of a longer walk, but it's a little bit more gratifying because you get some great views of the grotto. So here it is, one of the real treasures of Wanstead Park, the grotto. The grotto. Built by the second Earl. I think it spent a lot of time in... Uh, in Italy and elsewhere in the Mediterranean. And like a lot of those gentlemen who would do the Grand Tour, they would bring back parts of them with them in their heads and try to recreate it in their estates in England. And this was uh, once quite a, quite a majestic kind of place. According to Jeff's notes from the Roke map, you entered here via the gondola. And then there was uh, all sorts of decorations inside. I think it was lined with shells and sarcophagi. And they would have been, it would have been quite finely decorated. I guess they would have used it for dining and for entertainments. Unfortunately, it was damaged by a, a bad fire in the 1880s. So I've always plans to restore it somehow. It's quite beautiful in its ruined state though, isn't it? I love the fantasy that I speculated in my book that when Jimi Hendrix, the great Jimi Hendrix, played the Uppercut Club, just across the way there in Forest Gate, and this is apparently where he wrote Purple Haze, that he took a walk across Wanstead Park and had that vision for Purple Haze whilst altering his consciousness in the grotto here. 
come on, we can add that to the legend, can't we? Um, apparently, this is where Robert Mitchum filmed a scene from The Big Sleep. Can that be true? I've not seen the film or I've not seen it in my adult life. Well, there you go. It's part of the, the legends of Wanstead Park, one of the many. So we're going to carry on now as we move into sunset. It's the perfect time to be at the end of the canal. I was hoping that we would arrive here for sunset and it looks like we might be. Well, it's a bit before sunset, but it's still a good time. This is beautiful, one of the best aspects of Wanstead Park. Looking up along this canal here, it was built in line with one of the great avenues that led up to Wanstead House that would have been sat there on the top of the hill. This would have been one of the real sort of landmark features of the landscaping. Just on the other side of the canal, we have a wonderful view of the glorious river roading with its waters running high and fast. It's really wonderful to marvel at this landscaping and the, the beauty of it, the beauty of the grounds and imagining what would have been once upon a time. But history isn't just about the famous people whose names are recorded in history and the marks they left on the ground. It's really about all the people and all the interactions with it, the animals, the shape of the land, the earth itself, the rivers. And it's so beautiful to see the way that people use this glorious park all the time, all year round, even on a freezing cold day like this. And that for me is the glory of it, the legacy of it. It means, in a way, the idea when it was the, the property of earls and monarchs that the ordinary people of Wanstead would have full access to this great park is beautiful, wonderful. It's a little bit difficult to make out through the undergrowth. We've got like a, an island over here. There's a sequence of kind of three islands, part of the ornamental waters. And this one, as you can hear, is called Rook Island. Although I think what we can hear there are the new arrivals to Wonsa Park trying to usurp the herons, the green parakeets, of which there are huge numbers here now. And this fallen tree here forms an informal bridge onto another one of the islands. It's a kind of a curious kind of structure, really, if you look on the 1894 OS map. There's a series of kind of almost like structures. On uh, Jeff's notes on the Roke map, apparently the Roke map shows it as being like a folly, a fortification, some sort of, I don't know, mock-up of a medieval fortification where they would muck around, maybe, doing little reenactments. And uh, there's, a, there's actually an image of it on the Roke map. So I think this is actually called Fortification Island. And the largest island at the end here is Lincoln Island, the home of the herons. But have they taken up residence yet? Here's another one of my favourite places in Wanstead Park. This spot on the river roading that we've always called Pebble Beach. I don't know if anyone else calls it that. <laughs> but this is a real favourite spot of the dogs. You get all the dogs in the water here. And what's really interesting to note is the way that the water levels have gone back down pretty much to normal. When I was here a couple of weeks ago with my son, the water was up just below this wall here, right up about a foot below this wall, which is quite incredible. Shows you how much rain we had. So 
So we're just going to loop around Lincoln Island and the ornamental waters. This is just as the light is fading. This is usually the time of day when I'm walking around here. But we've still got a lot of our story to tell. But anyway, we'll pick that up as we get further along. Let's just go around this beautiful path here. This is a wonderful spot to come and sit on a summer's evening. It's absolutely perfect down here. So it's just after five o'clock, about quarter past five, and the, and the light is fading. I'm just making my way up the Great Avenue, the approach to the palatial Wanstead House. A house that was said to be even more grand than Blenheim Palace. You've either been to Blenheim Palace or seen an image of it and you know how huge it is. But this was said to be its rival, if not grander. Our story is far from finished. I've got so much more to tell you. You've got to find out how this all ended. <laughs> this grand palace, where is it? We have the grounds here, but where's the rest of it? Well... It's a bit dark really and I'd like to be able to show you a few things. Also I need to show you one of the greatest churches in London. So what we'll have to do, we'll have to come back tomorrow and pick up this marvellous story, one of the great stories of London. But we deserve a bit of daylight for that. So we'll come up tomorrow afternoon, it's going to be a bright and sunny day and finish off this incredible story. So just across from the, the Great Avenue leading up from the ornamental waters we find Wanstead Golf Course and this leads us to the, the next and possibly most dramatic chapter in the story of this most storied place. Now Wanstead Golf Club have very kindly allowed me to walk across the course here to see if I can find any remnants of the great Wanstead house. Some of the golf club buildings are the old service buildings and stables of the house and they're some of the few remaining buildings that survive. So you might be asking, what happened to Richard Childs, Sir Richard Childs, uh, Earl, what did he become? <laughs> Earl Tilney, the first Earl Tilney, Viscount Castlemaine. What became of his enormous mansion? It was one of the finest palaces in Europe which is quite incredible in an age of amazing, opulent, overly ost ostentatious palaces and mansions. Well, the house went from Sir Richard Long to the second Earl. I don't really find a lot written about the second Earl. I don't think he spent an awful lot of time here. And from him, it went to the Tilney Long family. Then it passed from the Tilney Long family to their daughter, Catherine Tilney Long. And so when she inherited the house in 1794, it was said that she became the wealthiest woman in England and she was single. And for some reason that's a little bit unclear, she could have had the pick of any man in the entire kingdom. In fact, probably any man in the world. And she chose to marry possibly one of the nation's most notorious rakes and scoundrels a guy called William Pole Wellesley, who then adopted Catherine's name, and it's too long to pronounce, particularly if you'd been in the George for a few pints, checking out the paintings and the diagrams of the Great Wanstead House. Now, I'm inclined to think old William Pole must have had something about him in order for Catherine to pick him above all her other suitors. He was known as a kind of a gambler, a spendthrift, a rake, a cad, any of those other words that you can that you can think of to use as a slur against a man's character. And it took old William just 10 years to burn through Catherine's enormous wealth. They got married in 1812 and by 1822 they were saddled with so much debt that he put against Wanstead House that the house had to be put up for sale. Its contents 
fetched £41,000. The house itself had no buyers. Nobody wanted this enormous opulent mansion. They tried to rent it out and nobody wanted to rent it. They tried to sell it and nobody wanted to buy it. So in the end, the house was demolished and sold for building materials. And now bits of the Portland stone edifice and the Doric columns and the porticos and the arches and all the grand features of that amazing opulent mansion are spread far and wide. It's said that some of the Doric columns ended up in a school porch down in uh, Plasto. I went looking for that a couple of months ago. No luck. But someone did say they still exist somewhere in Plasto. And you hear little stories about, oh, there's a, a bit of it in a wall in the Grove. I think that actually came from Grove House in Wanstead. I'd love to find all the bits of the great Wanstead House. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the footprint. There's a massive lake uh, on the golf course, the basin, that was one of the principal features of the house. It sat right in front of the house. And the footprint of the house is marked on the 1894 Ordnance Survey map. So let's go and see if we can find the footprint of Wanstead House. So here's the uh, 1894 Ordnance Survey map. There's the basin. And you can see the site of Wanstead House there. Now the, the basin is straight ahead through there on the other side of those trees. So the only indicator really you've got St Mary's Church, which is through there. So that would place Wanstead House somewhere here. I'm wondering if this dip in the land here is part of the foundations of the house because it must have had some pretty significant foundations. And that's the, the golf clubhouse there. We know those buildings were associated with Wanstead House as well. So it would mean that this here, there's the uh, practice putting green there. This is the area here. I would say is possibly the, the site of the house. Got a big lump of stone here that looks like it could be a remnant of the house. It said that one of the things that drew Josiah Child to this location when he was the, the chairman of the East India Company is that it was high enough up for him to be able to watch his ships coming back in along the Thames and up the Barking Creek. And these iron gate posts here were most likely part of the house as well, which gives us another indicator to its location. some numbers stamped in here 181 X A 020 I wonder if that actually is a J J8081 I don't know but it would seem to give us a clue about its past and this wall here separating the golf club from St Mary's churchyard I think was part of the the grounds of the house. We'll go and have a look at St Mary's Churchyard in a moment. This is Wanstead Cricket Club. And I think the cricket pitch here, I've read somewhere, was the lawn of Wanstead House. So that would place the house behind us there. So we'll just go around the, the cricket pitch to the basin, which really gives us a sense of the scale of the approach to the house. After the house was demolished and all broken up, parts of the lands were sold off and eventually the Corporation of London took over what is today Wanstead Park. For some reason they weren't interested in this part and what became the golf course or the cricket club. I don't know quite why. So is it true that there is st there's still a, like a path that runs through the middle of this? Yeah, yeah. 
just had a lovely chat with a couple of the, the staff here who confirmed that this is in fact the wine cellar of the house, the cellar of the house. So this, the house itself would have sat on top of this. So we're looking lengthways along Wanstead House. It's perfectly aligned there with the basin on the other side of the cricket pitch. And they reckoned actually that the cricket pitch hadn't really been touched, that it is the original lawns of Wanstead House. The other undulations there on the top are the ornamental gardens. And then down here is where they would have had the hot houses and the greenhouses growing all their exotic plants and fruits. And they gave me this picture of the house there at the bottom and then there's the long avenue and there's the basin and the drive leading to Leytonstone. It's amazing to be taking a walk through the grand Wanstead house. It would have probably extended all the way through and then on the other side. and mulberry tree, an old mulberry tree. And what I find curious about this is that James I was a frequent visitor to Wanstead Hall. So is this one of the mulberry trees associated with King James? It's possible. So Sam and Mike reckon this may have been the cook's garden down here. Hence the positioning of the tree. Well, some of these trees would be from the time of the house and the original Wanstead Park. It's now amazing. So apparently there are undulations in the ground here that would prevent German planes from landing during the Second World War. And it's uh, interesting. This has come up a, in a few places. I received it in an email. Apparently it was mentioned on Robert Elms. You can't really see it in the video, but if, you, if I walk over it, you see you go down and up. Well, that was absolutely fantastic to meet Mike and Sam. And they were a wealth of information about the old Wanstead house and the bits that still remain, the gardens. And it was wonderful to see the yew tree there and to be able to walk through the cellars, the wine cellars. You can imagine what the wine cellar would have been like. It would have been incredible. So thanks so much, Mike and Sam. And hopefully we can elicit more information from the people watching this video because there's still so much that we don't really know about this history of Wanstead House and Wanstead Park. We've talked about it already, but it'd be great to, to find out exactly, exactly where was the Roman villa and what was found here and what happened to the finds. Also, what happened to all that wonderful Portland stone that was sold block by block? It's been remasoned into new buildings. Elsewhere, where did it end up? Oh. Questions, mysteries. It's brilliant, isn't it? Fantastic. One last place to go and one last thing to look at. We're going to go and look at the glorious, amazing St Mary's Church here up on the hill. And St Mary's is one of the great churches of London. And this is the majestic St Mary's Church, Wanstead, sitting proud up on the top of the hill here. This is the only Grade 1 listed building in the London Borough of Redbridge. Sadly we can't go inside at the moment, but it is a magnificent church inside. The pews in there are the original 1790 pews. It's really very redolent of the past. It was used for the filming of the BBC drama Taboo with Tom Hardy. This is not the original church we built on this site. This church, I think, opened in 1790, and I think it was unofficially known as the kind of the East India Company's church due to Josiah Child living in Wanstead House, just the other side of the churchyard here. In the crypt, there is a jar with the pickled heart of Richard Child, who died in Italy, and they brought his heart home pickled in a jar, which is still there in the crypt. There's an amazing monument to Josiah Child in the church, a massive kind of like uh, marble frieze at the altar. It's incredible. 
and this church here replaced, I think it was a medieval church that was somewhere, I think, wasn't exactly on the site that that church is on. This one's got an incredible alignment. It catches the sunsets in a quite beautiful way. But the people, some of the people associated with the church told me that they believe that there might have been an even older Saxon church on the same site that's somewhere in the graveyard here. There's a number of quite interesting burials, including Dick Turpin's uncle. Yes, Dick Turpin's uncle was buried somewhere in this churchyard. Oh, looks like somebody's escaped. Aside from William Turpin, somewhere here there's the original kind of uh, the watch house when they had to have watchmen and guards in the in the churchyard to protect against body snatchers taking away the freshly buried bodies for medical experiments. And here it is. Here's the uh, the watch house. There would have been watchmen paid here to guard against body snatchers taking away the recently buried bodies. Inside. We can see the sun starting to set over the valley there, below this majestic high point here, crowned by St Mary's Church and the site of Wanstead House. It is so cold today, it's minus something. Anyway, I think this churchyard here at St Mary's is the perfect place to end our walk. I'm going to walk back along Overton Drive, the old approach to Wanstead House, back to Leytonstone. So thank you so much for coming with me on this real walk back through time. A majestic journey, a video I've been wanting to make for several years now so it's amazing to finally share this walk with you one of my favorite walks in the entire world and one i shall be doing frequently for many years to come thank you once again to my amazing supporters on patreon the radical ramblers and the fellow travelers and like i say get down to the comments because there will be some amazing comments down there with all the bits that i've missed out and additional information and memories and anecdotes and all sorts of wonderful stuff as I always like to round off these videos, and as I will always continue to round off these videos, I look forward to seeing you on the next walk, wherever that may be.